In the broadest sense, heat stress certainly has a negative impact on, on pig production, be it uh, through death loss or increased costs or certainly decreased production efficiency. Um, my interest in kind of the, the approach that I take is to understand what goes wrong, and then we can start to understand then how to fix it. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. And joining me in our podcast studios this week is Dr. Josh Selby. Dr. Selby tells me is a professor of animal science at Iowa State University. Josh, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Why don't we start with an introduction? Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me, Clayton. I very much appreciate it. Um, so I am a, a faculty member at, at Iowa State University in the animal science department. Um, my interest is in skeletal muscle biology, particularly related to injury. So how muscle gets damaged and why it gets damaged and how it actually uh, might repair itself. So not long after arriving, I got interested in heat stress. There's a Dr. Baumgard started here about the same time I did and, and got me wrapped up in, in his work. And it didn't take long before we were off and running and asking questions about how heat, stress, how heat stress is impacting skeletal muscle. Curious to discover if you can manage your animal data and team's work with the touch of a finger? Some of the best and largest pig farm holdings worldwide use cloud farms to collect and analyze data like never before. How? With the most advanced mobile app to collect data accurately and super fast. For breeding, farrowing, weaning, and finishing. Also, this is the easiest way to assign tasks to your team and motivate to work more efficiently. You instantly understand what gets done on time and what doesn't. So yes, you can manage your animal data with the touch of a finger. Very good. Josh, we're coming into the time of year where heat stress is very relevant for a lot of producers. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about, you know, why is heat stress important to the pig? Why should we care about it? And then what in particular has your group been looking at and trying to further research and characterize heat stress in swine? Sure. So in, in the broadest sense, heat stress certainly has a negative impact on, on pig production, be it uh, through death loss or increased costs or certainly decreased production efficiency. Um, my interest in kind of the, the approach that I take is to understand what goes wrong, and then we can start to understand then how to fix it. Uh, and we take the same approach for our, for our work in, related to muscle diseases. And it just seems to be a very practical, simple, straightforward way to, to solve, identify and then solve a problem. And it turned out this problem is a lot bigger and a lot more complex than initially we thought. So it's certainly a multi-systemic dysfunction where things are going wrong uh, almost in every organ system. And, and it detracts then from, from growth efficiency and certainly adds uh, to, to costs and veterinary costs and, and certainly even contributes to death loss. Uh, so we started just simply with heat with heat and muscle, and we found that there's, there's oxidative stress. So there, there's damage inside the cells. And then we started asking questions like, how did it get damaged? And why did it get damaged? And how long does this damage persist? And it turns out a long time. So this is, it continues to be damaged through the duration of, of heating events, at least through a week. Uh, we wanted to know about metabolism. So muscle is about 40% of the overall mass of the animal. It's a big, big chunk. So what happens then? So we figured out that the mitochondria aren't functioning the way that we should. This is work that we did uh, with Sarah White Springer down at Texas A&M. We figured out that the entire metabolome is different. So kind of what, what the animal is using for nutrients and how it's using those things is different. We figured out the mitochondria themselves, the way that they're built, the way that they're structured, actually changes with heat stress. And more importantly, it actually changes then by biological sex. So it turns out gilts have a more severe negative impact then do barrows. And then when we looked backward, we saw growth efficiency was actually different between those two animals. It looks as though gilts are more negatively impacted than barrows, at least through the first 24 hours. Um, we're, we're interested in nutrients. So how are these animals able then to even maintain themselves at all? Uh, what are they using uh, to supply the mitochondria, damaged as they are? Uh, we're still working on that question. It doesn't look like they're mobilizing fatty acids, even though they're nutrient restricted. They should be, but they don't appear to be. Um, it looks as though they're relying more heavily on carbohydrate, but not through the mitochondria. We know the immune system is activated and loves to eat carbohydrate. So it looks like preferentially the immune system is getting carbohydrate. Um, we're interested in then what's happening to amino acids. 
As animals come off food, come off feed, amino acids plummet in circulation, as you might expect. And we assumed the same thing would happen in skeletal muscle. But that's not the case either. It turns out skeletal muscle hogs, so to speak, hogs all of its amino acids and doesn't release them into circulation, with the exception of the ketogenic amino acids, which kind of which is a clue that perhaps these animals are relying on ketosis for ATP production. And that's actually something we hope to probe uh, much more in much more detail in, in future experiments. Well, you asked about or you brought up the skeletal muscle and the amino acids, Josh. Is that as simple as the muscle catabolizing itself? I mean, is that where it's it's pulling the amino acids from or is it still able to pull that out of the nutrition pipeline for the pig? That's a, a great question. So that, of course, food restriction, food restriction is an issue. So they don't eat as much as they should be eating or we'd like them to be eating. Um, so that's why we see them drop in circulation. Our presumption was and what dogma tells us is that skeletal muscle then will go through uh, catabolism and incre increase degradation of proteins to release amino acids to support circulation. In fact, we don't find that at all. What we find is that skeletal muscle holds all of its amino acids. We find that proteolysis does not increase. We find reductions in synthesis, but that should a reduction in synthesis without a change in proteolysis should create a larger free, larger free amino acid pool that could be released. And unfortunately, that's not what we see. For, so for some reason, um, something is allowing or causing skeletal muscle to maintain its amino acid load, with the exception, again, of these ketogenic amino acids that, that are released. And our presumption is that they're being used for ketosis just because they're so selectively reduced. It's something like uh, they're down 40 to 50 percent in skeletal muscle just after 24 hours, whereas the rest of the, the amino acids maybe there's a 5 to 10% reduction by seven days. And that's something we see both in barrows and gilts. So this, there's something really unique happening with those amino acids that I think is really going to unlock a lot of information about metabolic control during heat stress and preferred metabolic substrates during heat stress. Josh, you talked about uh, skeletal muscle, and I want to ask you about you know smooth muscle, cardiac muscle. But before we get into that, skeletal muscle in different areas of the body, have you studied it enough to know if skeletal muscle everywhere has these physical changes that are negative for the pig during heat stress, or is it more, um, uh, more skeletal muscle in some areas of the body are impacted at a greater rate than others? That's a great question. We, we have been really specific about looking at the semitendinosus, and we like that muscle because we can get to it pretty quickly. But the other is that it has very oxidative portions and very glycolytic portions. So they, they, differ, in, they differ tremendously in their metabolism. Most of the muscles in pigs are good, are mixed muscles, like the longissimus, which is, runs the length of the back. It's a good mixed muscle. Um, but because it's mixed, it doesn't give us a lot of detail about what's happening uh, within a specific fiber type. So most of the changes we see are happening in the oxidative muscle, so the mitochondria-rich muscle, as opposed to the glycolytic muscle. Um, so if we presume then that the pig is made up of about 50% type 1 muscle or 50% oxidative muscle, it seems likely this is going to be happening systemically, particularly in the fibers that are oxidative. Now, you ask a question about is it happening everywhere? We, got, we had this little great idea um, that because these animals are – they cool primarily through respiration. So ventilation rates go up tremendously, which makes the diaphragm go, go through, the work rate of the diaphragm goes up something like three to four fold. So over the course of a seven day period, these animals are breathing 500,000 more times than their thermoneutral counterparts. So we thought that would be a really cool way to study work in the heat. And so we removed diaphragms and we actually performed some of these same measures in diaphragm. And what we find is the diaphragm is actually resistant to these heat stress mediated changes. Uh, at least through 24 hours, we start to see some changes at seven days, but it's hard to know if those are heat related changes or if that poor diaphragm is just fatiguing. It's been really working hard for a week. Um, so it, it's not fair to say that all muscles respond the same way. I think what we're going to find is that the diaphragm is actually pretty unique uh, in the way that it responds to heat stress, whereas most of the traditional or more, more uh, conventional skeletal muscles behave the same way as the semitendinosus. Very good, Josh. How about the uh, smooth muscle side of things? Um, you you mentioned that gilts take the impact worse than barrows, and certainly some of those gilts are going to go on to have reproductive uh, life cycles. And some smooth muscle is a pretty important part of reproduction. Do we think that we would see similar um, uh, physical changes in smooth muscle as to what you've seen in skeletal? 
Boy, that's a good question. I don't have a good answer for you. I think that this is going to come down to a balance of uh, mitochondrial dysregulation, nutrient, nutrient availability and flexibility, as well as antioxidant capacity. And I don't know enough about how smooth muscle works system-wide to give you a really intelligent, predictive answer. I think there are some people that are working, working very, very hard on um, prolapse, for example, and I don't know if they've established relationships between uh, previous heat exposure and a greater susceptibility for prolapse. But that's a great question, and if they haven't, I hope they will look into that because it's, it's kind of a cool question. Yeah. Well, and uh, let's go back to the skeletal muscle here uh, for a second, Josh, because I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the fact that that's the product for most of these pigs, right? We, we are going to consume the meat. Do you know anything about impact to meat quality? Anything about impact to the color of the meat, the aesthetics, the eating experience or the shopping experience in particular? So overall, heat stress has a negative impact on meat quality. This is where you end up with more PSE meat. And a lot of that appears at least to be partially related to the redox state. So if you end up then with a more um, a muscle that's in a more oxidatively damaged state or more pro-oxidant state, it has a negative impact then on, on meat quality. I'm certainly no expert here, and there are, I'm sure there are others that could speak to a lot of detail about then what happens during uh, the the, the production process where you're actually going from muscle to meat and then how pre-existing conditions within muscle could then have a big impact on the biochemistry of the meat. Uh, essentially what's happening then with tenderization, what's happening with activation of proteolytic systems and, and calcium regulation that may actually then promote um, tenderization or, or color. Um, some of the other things, tenderness, things that we associate, pH, things we associate typically with a high quality product versus a low quality product. Certainly, I think we can say safely, heat stress does not help meat quality. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boring or Ingelheim representative to learn more. Yeah, well, it's uh, tremendous information, Josh. You know, I think uh, uh, meat quality is probably where the concerns about heat stress started, right? So like you said, PSE, the, the exudative meat, the stuff that doesn't look very good. Producers work very hard to select um, out of the heat stress uh, susceptible genotypes, uh, but it sounds like we've got a lot more work to do in trying to mitigate this overall impact, not only from a consumer eating experience standpoint, but also from a performance standpoint. You know, the, the bottom line of the producers, if those pigs are getting heat stress, it sounds like it's not just the period of time where they're hot and the losses immediately associated with that we need to be concerned about. But there's a lagging effect in there that producers should be aware of and an area of further research where we, we need some more information on understanding how bad of a lagging impact is that? And ultimately, how do we mitigate it? Thank you very much, Josh, for coming on and sharing all that information with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yep. Well, to our audience, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Josh and I couldn't be doing this without you. So we really appreciate you tuning in and, and listening. If you haven't checked out our website at swinehealthblackbelt.com, please go check that out. Uh, please like and, and review the, the podcast. Share it with a friend if you've enjoyed it. Uh, we really enjoy being able to bring it uh, to you. For Dr. Josh Selsby, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thanks for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H E L L O at W I S E N E T I X dot com.